and welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we're talking some spoilers about everything. I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And I'll start by asking, what's new with you, Alex? Um, I have been binge-watching the second season of Sense8. Ooh, you know, I didn't, I didn't watch the first one. <gasps> <laughs> I understand because the Wachowskis have had some troubles with some of their other, other original ideas. I, I have, I have mixed feelings on the two of them, yes. See, I love everything they do, even if it's problematic or bad. <laughs> it, although, oh, this is, this is a hot take. With the exception of The Matrix. Wait, not even the first one? Oh, I love all of all three of the movies, but not to the degree that everybody else loves or hates them. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Matrix is a whole subject, I think. Right, I think exactly. In both directions, it may have been blown out of proportion. I think, I think for sure. And it, I think it both helped their career and also... Gave them a weird, uh, I don't know, legacy of, of these projects that I think are like crazy, inventive, and awesome, but other people are like, oh, that's trash. See, I, I think one of my favorite things they've done is Speed Racer, and nobody likes that. <laughs> I think that's the only one I haven't seen. Really? But I mean, I, it's I, just I, I know all about it, though, yeah. Goofy and silly, but it's like, you know, it's a it's a fun time, and they, it just kind of, it is what it is, and, and I, I appreciate it for that. And that's how I feel about Jupiter Ascending. Like it's, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's objectively not great, but it's really pretty, and I don't know, I, I, I love campy space operas. You know, I, I didn't catch that one, but I have been really meaning to see it because I do really love that kind of cornball stuff. It's like, yeah, it's not good, but it's fun. And that's what it really looks like Jupiter Ascending is. It's funny because every single character in that movie takes the movie 100% seriously, except for Mila Kunis. <laughs> so it's like, like I don't know, she's, she's like... Like the, everyone else is just totally committed. <laughs> yeah, she's like trying to like use sarcasm on these like uh intergalactic um bank tellers and they're just like not getting it it's like that kind of thing <laughs> well how's uh, how's sense eight season two so the first season is just like super intense all over and then they did a um a christmas special to sort of bridge the gap because they had to um recast somebody who didn't want to participate anymore and they they sort of uh brought him in with with like a tongue-in-cheek moment about like, oh, you look different. And he's like, yeah, I feel different. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But but season two, I was really surprised, is actually like, on the whole, a super positive show. Like, there are so many beautiful, happy moments. Like, sure, there's mm. obviously going to be like dramatic stuff and and intense like fighting and stuff, but it's just it's so positive and you see so many wonderful aspects of these different characters lives that you're, you're like, I don't know. It just felt made me feel so warm inside. <laughs> well, that's good. Feel good show. Yep. Well, I, um, I've actually been up to a lot lately. Uh, most noteworthy, I guess probably is that I went and saw guardians of the galaxy volume two. I need to go see that like today. <laughs> you should. Okay. I've been hearing a lot of mixed things from people. Certain folks have expressed to me their extreme displeasure with the movie and you may be listening and know who you are, but <laughs> I actually thought it was really, really charming, really, really funny. I mean, it's not quite the first movie and of course a sequel isn't going to be but i feel like as far as marvel sequels go it's definitely up there in quality uh the best one's probably um captain america winter soldier but you know what this was really good and funny and like it made me feel things and i feel like everyone was in fine form like i really really liked it and i think that folks should go and see it because it was a good time well, I just, I don't understand why people would take a movie like that so seriously because the first one was not serious at all. So 
<laughs> well, I, I think that people, uh, the certain people have expressed to me that they thought the writing was just not up to par. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, and, and I take that point, and I raise them that it was good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was cracking up throughout this movie, and that's, that's surely something. I mean, yeah, I think something about the first movie was just that it was such a surprise, you know? It was it was just this amazing, magical, unexpected thing that happened. So nothing's going to feel the same, um, even if it were, you know, ultimately to be the same. But I'll say this. I thought that this was a much more worthy sequel than, say, Age of Ultron was. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, my life's been really weird, though, because... Um, we've been dog sitting for a friend um, for the past several days, and boy, has that taken a toll on our day to day lives. <laughs> this dog's a very sweet, very big puppy. Uh, he's a pit bull. Um, I don't think he's quite a year old, but he's, you know, he's all big oh. and grown. He's just, <laughs> just still a puppy. A puppy. Still, oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> And, I mean, he's a really, really sweet baby. Like, he's good and nice, um, but he's just he's just too big and excited all the time. Yeah, <laughs> He yeah. just really wants to, like, climb up on you and jump around. And he's been, he's been, like, tumbling around the backyard so much that he hurt his leg. Oh, no. And, like, I know, he's, like, limping around. And it's like, what did you even do to your leg, buddy? Uh, he just, and he, of course, he's a big, big puppy, and so he won't like just rest he's been he's been resting today i think i think he's going home today uh but he just wants to run around and jump around and he's still got this hurt leg so i'm sure he's not getting any better poor baby but boy this has been an adventure i don't i don't know where my cat is right now oh no (laughs) he's very upset by this dog he will (laughs) not come out he will not be he actually got gave me a real good scratch i don't blame him though um, we've been mostly keeping him upstairs in the computer room with us, uh, just so that he can hide. But he wanted to go downstairs in the middle of the night the other night. And I was like, okay, buddy, well, I'll carry you down. And probably the dog's asleep, so he won't even know. It'll be fine. We'll go get some food and water. We'll go to the litter box. It'll be great. On my way down the stairs, the dog comes out. And he just, like, walks up like, hey, yeah. And the cat just... Oh, freaked no. out and like jumped off of me scratched my face scratched my wrist pretty good but and just took off running into the garage so uh i don't know man it's been it's been a trial <laughs> i remember my my sister had a roommate who had a pit bull and the pit bull was actually living with them too and they have two smaller dogs and this pit bull was just the nicest dog i've ever met and but my, the, my sister's little dog was like playing with him but he was tired of it and and she was just like chewing on his ear and like like biting onto his skin because she's i don't know she's weird but <laughs> the pit bull had had enough so what he did he just pressed his chest down on her and like crushed her it was the funniest thing like he didn't use his teeth <laughs> he didn't use his claws he just like pressed her down and she was like well i'm stuck <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cute yeah, yeah it was really fun. It's weird having... I'm like, I love dogs, but I don't think that I am a person who ha- will have dogs. It's... <laughs> he's just <laughs> he's just too much for me. Like, dogs are just... I mean, they're sweet and darling babies, but they're just... They really take a lot of energy that I don't have the time to devote to a pet. That's why I like yeah. cats. They don't need anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, why don't we move on to today's topic? Sure. So we decided today to talk about comic books. Oh, how novel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could also talk about graphic novels. Even know, those? But... Wait, what about what about web comics, though? Oh, my goodness. I wasn't even factoring those in. Those are such a... Don't worry, I did. <laughs> that, that was... Okay, good, because like, that was like how I got... Because I didn't start off like reading comics. I didn't read comics as a kid. I, I, I wasn't really into superhero comics. Um, but I really got into comics, I would say probably, I don't know, I would say like high schoolish with some of the web comics that were out there. Mm-hmm. But I think we should probably start by clarifying that we're not just going to be talking about, 
you know, every comic ever made. Not just specific- any old comic. <laughs> Not just any old comics, no. Um, we're going to be honing in on queer comics. Woo! And for those of you who aren't necessarily comfortable with the word queer or you don't under- understand what I might be meaning by that, it just is a shorthand term that some of us prefer for LGBT. So today we're going to be talking about queer or LGBT comics. And boy, am I excited. <laughs> I'm really excited too, because I've recently started really getting into to graphic novels and comics. So Ooh, welcome to the fold. <laughs> um, so to start us off, I, I did I did some research uh, on the history of, of queer characters slash queer related comic books. So basically, like a lot of things in the past queer or any any mention of homosexuality in comic books was censored Mm -hmm. well especially with the comics code authority and all that exactly they they for those of you who don't know there's an authority that (laughs) is in charge or was in charge at least of what is deemed appropriate or civil in a comic book Remind me when this authority was um, created. Was it in the 50s? I didn't have that written down, but I just know that um, the mentioning homosexuality in mainstream comic books was uh, forbidden by them until 1989. So yeah. they were not having it for a long time. <laughs> and I'll, And much more than just homosexuality in comics as well like violence and questioning authority in comics that was all out out the window so for a while their mainstream comics were pretty dull (laughs) oh and language too even like Uh uh-huh and like just like it was very like general spookiness (laughs) yeah it was it was very much like comic books are only for kids and we have to protect them from anything which is just silly on all counts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, sure, I, I, I get it on a certain level, but it should be up to a kid's parent to really be interested in what they're reading. And yeah, that's, and if they that's need a to family censor thing. What they're buying or, or reading, then they can, you know, not an authority. And let's be, let's be honest, comic books have never been just for kids. <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. They're, I, I wouldn't even say they're, necessarily targeted at kids and a lot of the things that i came up with when i was looking this up is uh comic strips in newspapers Mm. like those are never for kids kids don't read the newspaper (laughs) yeah i used to read the comic the comics page in the newspaper when we still got that but no they were all kind of boring when you're a kid yeah i i don't remember if i wrote down uh which comic strip but there were a couple comic strips that that didn't um they weren't allowed to mention anything queer at all either uh until a couple characters in the 90s came out through some comic strips so that's kind of cool yeah um but there there were alternatives to to like the mainstream comics that were ruled over by this code authority but they weren't like mass marketed or sold yeah, well, a big a big sort of um, reaction to the Comics Code Authority was sort of the underground comics scene, you know, in the in the following decades with uh, guys like R. Crumb, who were just like, you know what, like, screw all of this. I'm going to make the filthiest, most obscene comics possible just to spite them. <laughs> well, that's like John Waters for the film industry, you know? Yeah. They were like, okay, I, I feel I'm like those two this, deserve comparison for sure. <laughs> yeah, like... It's it, they were so fed up with the way thing, the establishment and the and the status quo. They were like, okay, let's just completely go the opposite direction, and yeah, just make reject filth. it altogether. Yeah, it was all about filth. <laughs> Boy, did they! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, like uh, Fritz the Cat, our crumbs, like sort of most popular creation. That's some that's some <laughs> wild stuff in there. Um, and also these sort of uh, fringe comic writers were able to tackle subjects like queer characters or queer theory even Ooh. without, you know, having themselves censored. Mm-hmm. Which can you imagine yeah. like reading a queer theory comic book in like the 70s? 
<laughs> so crazy. It just like scribbled on like some piece of paper. <laughs> just well, yeah, and like you don't really see a lot. Uh, uh, you don't really hear a lot. I would I should say about like underground comics these days. But zines are definitely still around, and those are sort mm -hmm. of in the same vein where it's like a lot of it's visual. Um, well, I feel like maybe web comics have sort of taken that's, over that's true, for because, because for. You don't need, you don't need a you don't publisher. need the underground. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a publisher. You don't need an underground. You just need either to pay for a domain domain name or get a free, you know, get a blog, like get a blog, <laughs> and it's free, you know. Yeah. And a lot of like, yeah. So I you can do crazy stuff with the internet too, like gifts and you all that. Put whatever you want on the internet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but that was a that was a cruddy time for comics for well, sure. It, remind, and, it reminds um, me. It reminds me of other sort of literature in our history that w has been censored. Like I think of um, Allen Ginsberg, whose poetry was censored yeah. um, for for homosexual content and also just again filth in some cases. Yeah. <laughs> you can't reject authority without a little bit of filth. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so the, do you know when it came to an end then, this whole Comic Code Authority Well, thing? I don't, I don't know if they're still running or not. I didn't, uh. It's certainly you know. not something that's observed anymore by, like, anybody. Um, and I know that folks like Neil Gaiman worked to sort of get that all put behind us. Yeah, and, and I did find that they, specifically when it comes to, to queer, uh, issues, they, they stopped being so, so, so uh targeting of those issues in in 89 mm -hmm. and then and that's when you sort of see the hints here and there in like comic strips of either characters coming out in the in the comic strip or aids finally being mentioned in some that was a big one which i mean if you think about when aids began like to only start mentioning it and hearing about it through comics in the 90s is like okay <laughs> a little late Mm-hmm. So, uh, my understanding is sort of the the character who who is often pointed as being sort of influential in mainstream comics as far as uh, queer representation is uh, North Star from Marvel. Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, Alpha um, Flight North Star. Yes. I, I, I've heard of North Star. I, I don't know much, but... Yeah, um, I don't know much about him either, other than he's the one people are like, yeah, he was gay, and that was a big deal. Um, I don't know when the comics decided to bring so, him out. Uh, in 92, 1992. Um, so he was the first major gay character created by Marvel Comics. Um, mm -hmm. Created by uh, John Byrne. Uh, and it, according to John... He was supposed to have been gay since he was created, and he was created in 1979. Mm -hmm. um, but that almost sounds like a bit of a like, oh, oh, we were planning this the whole time, but we it just we it wasn't it wasn't appropriate then. So now we're gonna yeah, you well, know, I, and I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and say when he was conceived of, you know, the the creator thought of him as being gay, but knew that he couldn't actually represent that in the comics. Yeah, and those are your your cynical point of view and your not so cynical point of view. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, hope, I hope that he originally planned it because you know you, you know people had gay friends in the seventies and eighties that they might have mm -hmm. been gay inspired people did by. Did in fact exist at that time? Believe it or not, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> there were some gays. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt in that case. Uh, and then it's there's just a long of time course... to wait. It's just a long time to wait. Well, with the Comics Code Authority, what could they do? That's true. Like, this That's is true. Marvel Comics. They That's weren't true. allowed to. Well, and, and from what I found, uh, I guess DC was better about including queer characters, but I, I didn't find a specific example of that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about because because I, I know that their sort of big milestone as far as queerness goes is um, Apollo and uh, oh gosh, what's his name? His husband. Um, Midnighter? I don't know. Yes, Midnighter. Yeah, so it's uh, Apollo and Midnighter. Um, they were from, uh, they're most uh, famous from The Authority, which is a minor superhero group from DC. Um, and they are 
gay characters who did marry each other and adopt a precious little Singaporean baby girl. Um, but the fun thing about Apollo and Midnighter is that they're really um, clear analogs for Superman and Batman. Oh. <laughs> which I kind of love that this like minor version of Superman and Batman are gay husbands. So <laughs> That should be the next Batman versus Superman, like them fighting over who's wearing like the favorite pair of clothes that they share. Yeah, it's the it's the biggest event in DC history, the wedding of Superman and Batman. Uh, that would but, be so good. <laughs> that would be good. But we got a little version of that in uh, Apollo and Midnighter. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not like a one to one, but I mean, Apollo is very, very similar to Superman, and um, Midnighter is quite similar to Batman, although he's actually like an augmented person. He's got some kind of powers and he is very much all about the killing of the people uh, <laughs> but we've got like you know mr golden boy uh you know righteous superhero and his husband the scary man <laughs> i love that because but, um you don't always get queer characters that are v like if you get a violent queer character they're a villain you know yeah yeah whereas this guy is just like he's just a real spooky like mean killy superhero and he's in the you know <laughs> he, he's in the superhero team like he's allowed to do it and like he's part of the whole crew but he's the he's the darker one he's i like that so that's I, need fun. To, I need to look that up i like that a lot well yeah and, and <laughs> last year actually a, a a run of apollo and midnighter did come out and people really really liked it um, oh, cool. I haven't read it, but I want to. I've heard it's very, very good, and it's about the two of them, like, being superhero husbands. Um, and I think it specifically focuses on Midnight or more than Apollo. Uh, but I've heard it. I've heard very, very good things about it. I like that it's, like, the sort of yin-yang archetype of a couple. I mean, mm -hmm. even even their names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got, like a, like, a sun god and then Midnighter. Yeah, and then they just happen to be gay and married. <laughs> Yeah, they're gay and married and adopted a little Asian girl See, now, named Jenny that... Quantum. <laughs> um, okay, as soon as I stop laughing over that name. Um, Jenny Quantum, I know. <laughs> um, they, that would be like the best sitcom. <laughs> I like that, I like that. Imagine? It's like that domestic squabbles. Sitcom. Yeah, and then like they go off and, I don't know, that would be... Get on it, Netflix. Although you're all about Marvel, so you don't care about DC. Although they have yeah, one, I don't... they have one DC show that they carry on there. Yeah, um, but totally, like <laughs> that would be really fun. I think I I love I love the idea of the domestic lives of superheroes. Or even like somebody could do an online comic, sort of depicting a domestic. Because that's like, especially these days, we don't get a lot of other representations of different genres of comics. It's all action, all superhero comics that are made into movies and shows. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, and I think it's in some cases that might be a good thing because I don't necessarily need a comic. Or, or actually, no, they are doing a Dilbert movie, aren't they? Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, Scott Adams doesn't deserve that. <laughs> oh, oh, no, because that makes, that makes me think um, the new uh, Captain Underpants movie. Okay, that, but that's not a comic. That's a. I would I would say it's pretty close. It's it's a it's a. I mean, it's sure it's like a kid's almost novel, yeah, it's like an, but it's got a, a lot of pictures. Young reader's book. I would say it's close to a comic. There's enough pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like picture book plus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's certainly supposed to be in the vein. You know, it's it's a kid's spoof of. Well, and it's a superhero too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm optimistic. I, should, I think it could be cute and fun. I loved those books, so I'm hopeful. Um, so anyway. To, to go back on topic, um, I have a little bit, um, just a couple more examples from DC's side of things. Like, they had um, a couple queer characters in Teen Titans. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, Batwoman. Yeah, Batwoman um, in, I believe it was 2011, they brought her in um yeah they specifically out her because yeah. she was sort of hinted at being queer but they like specifically were like yes she's a lesbian which is always nice to just have them yeah it's nice to just say it yeah <laughs> use the word <laughs> for even, it even, 
<laughs> or like like you don't even I don't know. It's you don't have to necessarily like have a picture of them kissing somebody of the same sex but like just being like okay yeah she's a lesbian but she doesn't she's just she's um, got other things going on too she's she's real busy (laughs) (laughs) but she is not too busy for for her lesbian times she's definitely had some um queer relationships since then and that's been pretty cool and that makes me think of um tracer from overwatch i was gonna say that (laughs) and she she was revealed to be gay in, in a comic. In my comic, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I mean, I, I don't play Overwatch just because I never bought it, and so I didn't it's like very fun. Get into it when everybody else got it. But I like I know everything about it because I think it's really interesting. Yeah. And so that that was that was such a wonderful moment, and to have it presented in comics like that. Yeah, and just yeah. it's just very straightforward. Like, yeah, this is this is her girlfriend. And they're having Christmas. It's nice. Yeah, when she's not busy saving the world, she's... At home with her cute red-headed girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, I thought it was very, very funny because before she was explicitly um, revealed to be lesbian and uh, before her partner was introduced, people often shipped her with um, Widowmaker, who, uh, whose real name is Amelie, and then... Tracer's girlfriend's name is Emily, and I just thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's weird that they shipped those two since they're like mortal enemies. Well, that's how you ship, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's what a true. ship is. <laughs> a- across party lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's just like they, they had a big video together, so, you well, know, and, you just want to. I know that fans, me included, were really waiting for a queer cast member. Yeah, I mean, because, like, Zarya is very coded as queer. Um, yeah, but, but... We don't know much about her personal life. Yeah, exactly. And there could be any number of other characters, because it's not something that comes up a lot when you're fighting people with guns. Yeah, they're, they're really very busy with other things. <laughs> so, I do think it's interesting, though, that basically every single Overwatch ship is gay. Like, you've got McCree and Hanzo... Um, you, who else is there that's that's shipped? Because it's just just gay. Oh, oh um, uh, Zarya, Zarya and May. Oh, and uh, the one that's almost legitimate, been legitimatized by Blizzard is uh, Roadhog and what's his and name? Junkrat. And Junkrat, yeah. I love them so much. And Junkrat. that's that's one that nobody is like dismissing either. You don't see people like, oh no, they're not in a relationship. It's like everybody knows. They're, yeah, they're, Junkrat's my favorite to play. I really, really love Junkrat. I, I'd probably enjoy playing him if, if I played it, just because I very much like grenades. <laughs> He's very, very fun. And I just adore him. He's a sweet boy. He's just a sweet trash boy. <laughs> <laughs> but to bring things back around to comics, um, one that I really wanted to mention, because it's just, like, my favorite queer comic of all time, and I wonder if you've heard of it, is the legend of bold Riley? I haven't heard of that. Oh my gosh! So this was recommended to me by my dearest lesbianist friend, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's just the most wonderful comic. So it's it's sort of like a hero epic, um, you know, in the style of maybe you know medieval uh, or ancient you know epic stories about a hero's travels and adventures. But in this case, the hero is a female, lesbian, Indian-coded princess. And it's wonderful. So her real name is um, uh, Rivashana, I believe. But um, uh, uh, something about something like that. Sorry, sorry, I feel bad. I'm not super familiar with pronunciation for that uh, particular type of... Oh, especially if you're reading something. I always, like, make the word easier in my head. Yeah, well, okay. Hang on, I want to I want to get it correct. I just uh I just need to actually read it to know. Like the first time like when I was reading Harry Potter for the first time, I thought it was like Hermione or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah we I, We all did that. Yeah, Hermione. <laughs> uh okay. So, um the hero's real name is uh, Rila Vashana. I I believe is the pronunciation and she comes from this Indian coded country and she's the youngest in the uh in the family, in the royal family. Um, but she's just sort of got possessed with this sort of wanderlust and one day decides that she has to abdicate her right to the throne, leave 
the palace and go and have her adventures. She just, she can't be content to stay at home. She's got to go and, like, be a hero and an adventurer. And the cool thing about this comic is that every sort of chapter, because it's written as sort of, like, episodic, every single chapter is illustrated by a different artist. Um, it's oh, all written I love by, that. Yeah, it's written by <laughs> Leia Worthing, uh, Weathington. But uh, she, yeah, she got all these different artists to draw her different um, chapters. And it's beautiful and fun and cute uh, and very lesbian, <laughs> <laughs> which I really appreciate. I mean, because, you know, it's, it's like Asian medieval fantasy type stuff. So they're not necessarily going to use the word gay. They're not necessarily going to use the word lesbian. But the entire comic, she is very explicitly shown to be a woman loving woman like she's she has many romantic encounters with many ladies um, and it's just sort of the way that it is and nobody questions it it's just that's her that's her jam and it's really fun and really really cool um the chapters sort of take place in different countries coded after like real world countries because she comes from a, an india like place and she travels to a land that's very sort of aztec or incan um there's a uh, sort of a cambodian type place and a korean type place and it's just really wonderful and fun and beautiful and gay <laughs> that makes me think i recommend of... it yeah that sounds awesome um i have it made while you were just talking it made me think of the different ways in which queer characters are sort of portrayed so there are some comics or i guess this could apply for other uh literature but it's either fantasy world where it's not necessarily mentioned or there's not necessarily a word for it or if there is a word for it it's different from our world which is what mm -hmm. applies to what you were just talking about um or in a lot of superhero comics, because they're sort of sp supposed to be set in this real world, they have to, and, and maybe that's why it took them so long to catch up, was they have to sort of use our words and confront the issues in the ways that they were confronted in our history. Yeah, I mean, each superhero lives in the time that the comic is set, and which is usually just right now. Yeah. So I, I don't know, it's, I think it's interesting how they either just do away with the conventions of, of the world and just go for it, or mm -hmm. they have to sort of navigate the politics of our time, which is, ugh, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> no, that's why it's fun writing in imaginary land. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so something with Lennon Le Le Bold Riley, because... People are so, so, so silly when it comes to, um, you know, representation of different ethnic groups or um, sexualities in fantasy fiction because they're like, well, it's supposed to be the Middle Ages, so I can't, they, I, they can't be gay. And it's like, listen, you got dragons? I think you can change other things about the world, too. Like, you've already <laughs> changed something a lot more unbelievable. If I can make that mental leap... I can make the mental leap that an Indian princess could be lesbian and nobody cares. <laughs> like I feel also, like Also like there's there's already historical examples of gay people before that time period. Yeah, you know, if you're if you really are committed to historical accuracy, how about you read up on actual historical relationships with queerness because it's maybe not what you would have expected. Yeah. And and even like they don't always when they just sort of do broad statements like, oh, the Greeks were super gay. It's like, it's it's a little more complicated than that, actually. <laughs> well, because, like, the time that they're talking about, the Greeks weren't a thing. Like, there were the different Hellenic city-states, and they did not identify with, you know, being Greek at all. There were the Spartans and the Athenians and what have you. So, like, clearly you don't know anything about history. And so... they all had completely <laughs> different opinions on it, too. Yeah, so, like... Let's not sit up on this historical high horse if you don't actually know anything about history. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I think, oh, I, I wanted to mention a, a comic that I recently bought that you the one that you were just talking about reminded me of. Um, I was just on Tumblr and you know, Tumblr, you find things. Uh, and it's this. find so much. It's, it's a, a print version of a, an online series that the writer did, uh, Jesse Zabarski is mm -hmm. the writer. 
Um, and the, the title is Witch Light. Oh, that rings a bell. I would look it up because you might recognize the, the art. It's a very, like, bubbly, colorful art style, even though most of it's in black and white. <laughs> but, yeah, it was it was originally, I believe, uh, published online because there's different sections, uh, like dip, part one, part two. Um, and then it got compiled as a as a graphic novel, and it's about these... I, I, I'm, I don't know if it's... I don't know specifically how they identify gender wise, uh, but I, my assumption is that they're, they're, they both identify as women and they're in a, a gay relationship together. Um, mm. But there's just a lot of, um, not only is it, you know, a fantasy world where there's magic and swords and, and a candle floating above one of the main characters heads. Um, but also <laughs> like they defy most gendered conventions. Like, they both let their hair grow as long as like their body hair as long as they want because they're out traveling the world it's hot you know <laughs> they are, they've got other know. things on their they've mind got things to worry about yeah <laughs> um and it's it's very it's very cute like they have very cute yeah i'm looking at it now and it's just precious it's so precious oh and the, their little eyebrows <laughs> <laughs> oh man and actually the uh the webcomic i wanted to bring up is super related to this because it is another very cute very sweet lesbian comic about witches <laughs> Lesb- so okay i saw another post on tumblr it was like not all gay people are witches but all witches are gay people <laughs> <laughs> i like that i was like okay that's pretty true <laughs> yeah have you heard of um balderdash or a tale of two witches Balder, I think both of those sound familiar. Let me look it up. Well, no, 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 that's all one title. Balder oh, Dash yeah. or a Tale of Two Witches. Yeah, explain it while I look it up really quick. Yeah, so it's it's this adorable little um, web comic. I'm trying to find the name of the author. I've been reading it for a while, but for some reason I am not <laughs> sure who makes it. Uh, and the the, the oh, sign very on similar art style. Yeah, isn't it really something very, very cute, very fluffy, um, just a good time. So, yeah, the um, creator just signed it off VGE, so I don't know who this person is. No wonder I didn't remember uh, <laughs> <laughs> who makes it, but it's it's just the sweetest thing. It's, it's about these two witches um, in this sort of very fun, um, fluffy fantasy world, uh, Georgie and... So it's an E. Got it. I'm feeling silly forgetting the name of the other character. Afia. So Georgie and Afia. And they're both witches who end up through very different circumstances coming to this little village and meeting one another. And it's just, I, you know, they've in the at the point that the comic is at, they've only just met. But I can tell it's going to be the sweetest and fluffiest lesbian romance. Um, one of them is a baker who likes to use magic in her baking, but she's trying to learn how to bake like <laughs> without magic. And the other is um, a traveling sorceress who has just sort of accepted that she is like a seer sort of person, um, that she, she's inherited this ability from her grandmother. Um, and they just meet in this little town that they've both arrived at and they're gonna have lovely cute times together and <laughs> just a good nice fun sweet time this website is amazing <laughs> there's like links to recipes and like yeah well because one of the characters spells. is a baker yeah this is awesome. and there's like a map too like <laughs> yeah the, the the two recipes here are two things that that um georgie like they're, they're related to georgie's story um as she's learning to bake and it's really cute. <laughs> so yeah, that's another uh, recommendation for comics about girls who like girls. Well, and isn't the like classic version of that Buffy? Like, well, um, I'm gonna say Xena. Well, was Xena a comic though? <laughs> no, I guess not. But Buffy was Buffy... a TV show. First. Was it a com- oh? It was a t- okay. I just I wasn't. Well, it sure was a movie was... first, but there was no lesbians yeah. in the movie. And then yeah. it was a TV show. Okay, I wasn't sure um, what, they, when the comic came along. Yeah, they spun the, the comic off of the... That's what I thought, show. but... But, yeah, very prominent lesbian witches in that one. Very good. Um, and then we got, of course, the classic Xena lesbian undertones. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I just want to, like, list a couple of the other things that I saw. Like, I believe the current Green Lantern is a gay man. Yes, I, I Which had really heard appeals that. to me because I remember watching uh, Justice League. I don't remember what iteration of it. It was like the mid 2000s version of it, I think. Where Green Lantern was a black man. Yeah. Oh, God, and I loved name. him. He was my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel bad for forgetting that particular. Was it John? Kind. Well, no, John is the. Um, the Martian. I mean, yeah, he's, he's Martian Manhunter. I swear it's another John, but I'm, I'm probably Could be. I'm wrong. I mean, it's a I'm very wrong. common name. I wouldn't be shocked, but that but anyway, may just the, be. Crosswires. The current one, um, or is, it's, I guess it's a reboot of a classic um, mm-hmm. Green Lantern is Alan Scott. And I again, I need to look into that because I was telling my, one of my friends, I was like, I pretty much have devoted all of my reading and movie and TV watching time to specifically queer stuff because i don't have time for anything else <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair you gotta prioritize well and it's like i immediately have some sort of strong connection to it you know Mm-hmm. and i, I mean the, the great thing about comics too is you know the sort of underground comic scene and then the way that web comics have taken over is it is a really um broad and inclusive community so I think a lot of people have found solace and comfort and acceptance in comics especially queer comics well yeah because it's uh, it's uh, accessible via the internet yeah especially. yeah uh, yeah when things had to be underground it was a lot harder for people to find this stuff but now it's just all out there for anyone who needs it yeah, and then and then like certain publishers or small presses can be like, oh, this is doing well. Maybe we should make a book version of it. Mm-hmm. Or people like um, Leia Wellington, you know, do a Kickstarter and say, hey, I've got this concept and I really want to make it a reality. Is there anyone out there who wants to help me do it and wants to read it? And then all the the queer nerds are like, yes. <laughs> yeah, they did <laughs> very much so. Yeah, um, the uh, sequel to The Legend of Old Riley is in the works right now. They kickstarted it a couple of years ago, and they're still working on it. Um, and I'm very excited for that to happen because I just really love The Legend of Old Riley. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, probably one of the more classic depictions that is is sort of it's supposed to be um, under tone or I, I don't know where my brain just went um x-men oh yeah well yeah that's i mean that's been used as a metaphor for a lot yeah. of different groups but yeah definitely a queer thing especially in the um the the movies i i mean you say especially in the movies but we don't we still don't have an out character in the movies yeah that's true that's very true um i still i still get the sense that that's the metaphor that was being specifically um used even though they didn't then well because <laughs> i suppose you have to make a choice there because then you might have sort of a weird double whammy going on where you're like being a mutant is a metaphor for being gay and also this mutant is gay <laughs> yeah I, and, and, and they'd have they'd have issues where it's like they're fighting on two different fronts, which I mean, a lot of people do. They have yeah. multiple intersecting identities, which would be such a great topic to tackle in a comic or some sort of X Men thing. I agree, definitely. And you know, there in the comics, at least there there are many queer mutants. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but I I think I don't know. I would certainly love. I just want Professor X and Magneto to end up together. <laughs> <laughs> you and everybody else, man. You and everybody else. Any other uh, queer comics you wanted to mention? Or... Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, Archie. Yeah, Archie. Now that's an interesting one. So I've, I've never really read Archie. Um, or Does any anybody of the... actually read Archie? <laughs> <laughs> or any of the numerous spin-off comics. To be fair, um, Ryan North of Dinosaur Comics recently wrote a run of Jughead that looked spectacular. Oh, that's so... I I, I know... I don't know him personally, Ryan North, but I I, I know Dinosaur Comics. I, his, one of his best writer friends is my favorite writer, so... Okay, yeah, and then he also um, was writing Squirrel Girl. 
on Google oh. Squirrel Girl, which I just really love. <laughs> See, those are examples of like indie slash underground internet comics and their writers becoming like the leads of certain really yeah. well-known comic book franchises. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, qu queerness in Archie is a very interesting topic. Uh, I guess we should start off uh, chronologically. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, in 2010, uh, Archie Comics introduced their first gay character. Um, his name is Kevin Keller. <laughs> um, and that was in issue 202 of Veronica. Okay. I read up a little bit on, on how his character was introduced, and it, it seemed all fine and dandy for the most part. But then I think it was Jughead who was like, using him to get back at Veronica by making her fall in love with the gay character. Oh, well, that's a little exploitative. Is, it is very exploitative for both Veronica and for this Kevin, the gay kid. Like, that's yeah, Jughead, really what are you doing being such a jerk? Right? And, like, like I sort of get that because that's a very teen thing t to happen, and I think that's sort of true to life in certain ways. Like, I, I, as a gay man, I've had certain experiences specifically in high school that were like i don't know people not necessarily using me but like wanting me to be a certain kind of person mm -hmm. that you definitely feel sort of exploited in that kind of way sure and that uh, that rang true to me even if that's not the best example uh, if you're trying to i don't know it, it's it's certainly a true to life sort of story yeah fair enough even if it's not like necessarily the most nice. positive example and nice yeah <laughs> yeah um and but, then um, he ended up getting married didn't he i don't know i i i, I, I remember so. there being nice. a gay wedding in archie and i figured it was him i don't know how maybe old I'm... they are do they grow up or not i don't <laughs> yeah they do get older they definitely grow up into young adulthood Okay. Just yeah, depends. Again. I mean, I think they've just sort of like rewound the clock on Archie a few times because sometimes yeah, they're mean, in high school, but sometimes they're adults, and yeah. I don't really know what the deal is. Like, nobody actually reads Archie, so nobody really knows what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to pull it up, but the next one I was talking going to talk about for Archie is uh, is Jughead, um, and it was in 2016. Uh, Jughead comes out as asexual. Huh. Which, I don't want to argue with anybody over whether somebody would include asexuality in the LGBTQA spectrum or queer. I personally do. Um, so do I. I. And again, people can ar you can argue all day long, but I'm like, you know what, it's just easier and I feel like they should be included, so let's include them. Yeah. <laughs> um, asexual people aren't straight. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm trying to find out who was writing it at that point, because if it is Ryan North, that would be really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly when was. he's... T I, I uh, think it, was it's, it probably was just before was was writing it at this point. Okay, yeah, and I think, I think Ryan North took over after him. Well, hopefully Ryan follows in the footsteps of, of having... Uh, Jughead be out an asexual because I, as as I was reading up in the past Jughead was always just not in romantic relationships yeah but it was never explicitly stated whether he was asexual or not and then in in this issue from 2016 uh his buddy's just like oh yeah you're you're asexual so you don't have to deal with all this junk <laughs> yeah and I think North's run on Jughead just recently came to an end, but I know I've just heard some funny little things about like I think that there was a crossover with Sabrina the Teenage Witch that sounded pretty hilarious. Um, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Jughead and Sabrina, but um, I mean he's a he's a Ryan North is a cool guy, and I I trust him to write things respectfully and you know in a in a cool way. I wanted to talk about um, just the different visuals that comics use as storytelling yeah and how most books don't get to use those and I, I i wanted to bring up one of my favorite uh 
visual artist right now um, is a guy named Jeremy Cerise. Okay, and he does like he, he does like um, cartoonish, almost Norman Rockwell sort of styled art. Um, it's a very immediately recognizable style of art, but he's queer sort of, and sort of an Americana thing. Yes, very much so. Um, but he's queer, and almost all the um, drawings or paintings that he does are queer people, or explicit. Like, and some of them they're explicit, like somebody getting a blowjob, or you know. Mm-hmm. But he he also has been doing a lot of comics, um, and the one I have in my hand right now is called Curveball, and it's it's a pretty thick graphic novel actually Mm -hmm. um that is almost entirely queer the main character is uh, i believe gender non-conforming um and it is it is explicit it's not there's no sort of you know reading between the lines that you have to do like there's a robotic doorman at their apartment who's just like uses the correct pronouns and all that sort of stuff and it's kind of wonderful um, that is nice. It's refreshing. Right? Uh, and not having to, like, read between the lines. Uh, and, like, that that can be nice sometimes in, like, a fantasy sort of setting. But this is a sci-fi setting. Uh-huh. So it makes total sense that it would all be, like, explicit and sort of... A little bit more real world. A little bit more real world, but, like... <laughs> idealized. <laughs> I- idealized, at least, at least when it comes to... Uh, the treatment of certain queer characters in this. Obviously, this character has some issues, like a a guy that's always hitting on them and is kind of annoying um, (laughs) and not necessarily getting things right. But, like, the fact that technology gets it right is kind of cool. Yeah. So Um, they don't care. They've got no prejudices or hang-ups. Like, (laughs) it's just like, give me the information. (laughs) Okay, now I have the information. (laughs) Um, But it's just a, it's a gorgeous style like it's black and white but then there are also several pages and a lot of um parts of certain pages that are neon orange Hmm. and that sort of the neon orange is supposed to portray like electricity moving and fire and projected like holograms and stuff okay so it's just it's just really vibrant and wonderful and queer and it's sort of a crossover of where fine arts and comic books can meet and we don't always think of those two things together especially because a lot of people's idea of comics is superhero comics which again i would say are art and and a fine art but not everybody would agree with that i would think they're i mean they certainly don't they're they're, it's more of a it's pop art yeah and it's it's a it's it's meant to convey a lot of times movement which isn't always easy to do (laughs) <laughs> no, no. Um, then there there are you know other sort of, I guess less mainstream but still within, uh, the mainstream stuff. Like I'm just thinking about Neil Gaiman's um, Sandman. Yeah, and it's got some really, really, really beautiful visuals, really interesting and expressive stuff. And it technically does take place within the canon of the DC universe, oddly enough, <laughs> uh, the far future of the DC universe. But um. But oh gosh, beautiful stuff. Yeah, and I just I just really appreciate it when I don't know when artists try new things. I don't know where I'm going with this anymore. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I, I, I well, I mean, because that's one thing that that comics have. As mean, I mean, it is it's the confluence of words and pictures. Like that, the, both things are very integral to what comics are as a medium. Uh, and so it's really nice to see artists and writers sort of working together to try new things and, and try to express themselves in interesting ways. Exactly. And uh, I'm, there's not really another example of uh, another art form where writing the written word and any sort of visual art are combined. I mean, you could say that foreign films <laughs> yeah. well, could, I mean, could apply, I, but I, only if you need the subtitles to read them, you know? <laughs> Ideally, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, and I guess, yeah, it is kind of interesting to, to, to 
look at the distinction between hearing spoken words and reading written words. Yeah. Um, because, you know, obviously there are other mediums where the where verbal communication and visual communication are ideally combined, you know, cartoons and film. Um, but certainly comics are, the, they have the corner on visual writing and visual art. And I think they can be powerful, especially to a writer who's like, I know exactly how I need this to look. I don't need... Or I don't necessarily, I mean, they probably don't think this way when they're writing, but they're like, I have a really specific idea of how these characters are going to look, how this world's going to look. I don't want readers to necessarily imagine the wrong thing when they're reading it. So I think that's where comic books can really aid a writer who is like maybe thinking of this really abstract sort of world and they need, they want to sort of get that across a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely helps. I mean, and with something like, say, The Legend of Bold Riley, it's much more explicit that these cultures are coded in this way because they can use visual clues from those cultures to communicate that. And Riley has a, you know, it's supposed to be the mark of her royal birth, but she's got a very large red circle on her forehead, which is reminiscent of a bindi. Um, and, then, you know, these other cultures, you can just take these cues to say like oh this looks like an Aztec or Incan world because I I, I can see the sort of art and, and clothing that's being uh, shown and extrapolate that and it's, it's I guess maybe more elegant than just than trying to like write it in with words and have it be and, and risk having it be misunderstood or yeah I mean because gosh I... people will just do anything to imagine characters of color as being white people <laughs> so it's like I, no I, riley is indian <laughs> look at how brown she is she's indian she's not white and you know uh i think a lot of us are guilty of that just because our immediate thought is to well this isn't necessarily true but um some of us might immediately just go to look at a character as the same race as ourselves but sure, it's also I mean, it's, but it's also like how we're conditioned to assume um, in America, whiteness is default. Exactly. Well, in a lot of the world, whiteness is default. Yeah, and this sort of goes back to our conversation about um, the ghost in the shell and those kinds of things. Yeah, I was I was watching um, Feminist Frequency had a new video with, oh, I don't remember her name, but she used to do, she got in, I don't know, not trouble, but um, there was a lot of uproar when she started doing those um videos about feminism and gaming. Anita Sarkeesian? Yes. She started a new series um, about, it's almost like a, it's just, it's more broad than the video game series of videos. So the newest one is very similar to one of our past episodes talking about racial representations in movies and film or movies and and shows. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was like, oh, hey, we just talked about that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's definitely a big uh topic at the moment with all of these adaptations of things coming out and you know people were really thinking about it more and i was I, th- I just thought of that because um you we, you mentioned um white as the sort of blank slate yeah um for characters and she mentions that as how hollywood is always like everything's you know starts off as white and then you go from there you know yeah, well, I mean, do you remember, like, when um, the Hunger Games movies were coming out and Amanda Stenberg was cast as Rue and people were like, what? Rue isn't black. Even though if you, like, you read the book, like, no, she is black. I mean, it's maybe a little bit of a shame that the author doesn't explicitly describe her yeah. as being black, but she's definitely described in a way that sounds black to me, but people, you know, certain people reading that just didn't make the connection because they didn't want to yeah which sucks (laughs) (laughs) well i think that's uh, especially when it comes to talking about queer um stories you know we don't always want to have to assume sometimes we want it plainly stated you know yeah let's let's just come out with it sometimes and say like yeah we don't want we don't want straight to be the to be the the go-to 
Yeah, and then, you know, I do think it's a little cruddy when people like, you know, J.K. Rowling will say, like, actually, there were gay characters. You just didn't know it. It's like, well, it doesn't count then. (laughs) It doesn't count if they're not actually, you know, described as being queer in the text. It doesn't doesn't matter. (laughs) It doesn't matter that Dumbledore was gay because... As far as the book is concerned, he wasn't. See, I was lucky. I mean, I don't know lucky, but um, I didn't read the final book until after she had made the statement about Dumbledore being gay. Mm -hmm. So I immediately didn't have to You were able to pick up on it? I I, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so blatant. (laughs) That's funny. Uh, But yeah, I mean, you know, there are certain things that, I mean, because even comics, you know, at least with race, it's going to be fairly explicit. When you draw a character, like, yeah, that's a black person. But if they are a gay person, you're not going to see that unless it's put in there. And there are certain ways to do... I, you can probably try to get away with it visually. Like in the in Curveball, the character of Avery is like... Dress it. I, I, this is such a. I shouldn't even mention it. But like... Because you can't dress like the proper way to be... You know, a non-binary. But person, there are you certain know? ways of sort of coding yourself exactly. as being gay visually. Avery, Avery is very coded as non-binary. At least to me, like I recognize it, and I appreciate being able to recognize that. Um, but yeah. I also know that not everybody who is non-binary or trans or gay is gonna present in a way that we expect them to. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to mention really quickly that. Um, I think comics can be so varied because the visuals allow so much creativity without the cost of CG. Yeah, I think we've talked about this um, previously, the idea that it doesn't necessarily cost any more to draw, you know, an alien armada or an empty room. But, you know, then, of course, there's the cost in... (laughs) time and sanity to the artist but ultimately it's not the same thing yeah ultimately it's it's possible as long as you put the work in but it, it's not like you need a whole you know giant studio backing you yeah you can just do it which i think is is what inspires such creativity and originality yeah you can do stuff about anything in comics and that's that's what's so rad about comics. <laughs> oh, um, before we um, wrap up, I did want to mention uh, as a sidebar, so when we were talking about uh, romances in Star Wars, I believe I put that in a bonus episode when we just talked about Star Wars for a really long time. Um, <laughs> I was talking I was talking about um, the Hollywood romances of Harrison Ford and how sort of toxic and gross they pretty much always have been yeah especially back in his sort of heyday um he he was you know in movies his romances were always a little um coercive and and gross um you know border (laughs) sometimes getting all the way to you know sexual assault uh but i i found this really good video essay um called Predatory Romance in Harrison Ford Movies um, that I want to recommend to people because it's a really good exploration of this sort of period in Hollywood's history. Uh, The video is by the YouTube channel Pop Culture Detective, and I'll link it. Uh, It's from the uh, YouTube channel Pop Culture Detective, and it's just sort of looking at the way that Harrison Ford was a role model to a lot of um, boys and young men back in sort of the 80s. Um, and the unfortunate implications of a lot of his romances. Uh, so especially in his roles as Han Solo, Indiana Jones, and um, Deckard in Blade Runner. Uh, and it's it's a really great video, not not too long, it's under 20 minutes, and just super duper fascinating look at the, the way that he performed masculinity um, in relation to women. So I will yeah. link to that one. That does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us, and like this video if you only like us. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album, Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember, no No guilty guilty pleasures. pleasures.